Hello everyone and welcome to this new instructional series. We're going to be going through what makes the Sidemount Essentials course unique and comprehensive. We'll talk about all the secrets behind the program and this video will focus on day one. There will be five days in total as well as another video explaining the Sidemount experience session which you could say is a watered down version of this video which covers everything in day one. The secret to success, all divers must have their equipment configured correctly, be correctly weighted, they must do lots of swimming, and the entire day must be as enjoyable as possible. Day one is all about finding out where each student is at, their skill level and ability, and what it is they want to achieve. Because what you should aim to do is not only meet that, but surpass their expectations. It all starts with your dive site selection. Each day, you'll need to focus on different things, but it's crucial that day one, you need to focus on the side mount experience. You want a site you can easily stand and it does not have waves and surge. What you're looking at right now would not be suitable for day one. Maybe on day three, four or five, but not on the first or second day. You want a site like you can see here that's got no waves or surge and offers each diver plenty of standing room. For day one, to be successful, you want to focus on in-water time, not time to explain to people the things they could have learned and should have learned from watching the online training series. This includes all cylinder configuration, regulator setup, and your harness configuration. All these things can actually be done prior to the start of the course. If you're going to be providing equipment to any of the students on the course, I suggest you allow several hours the day before the course start to configure that equipment. Any students joining that already have their own equipment purchased before the course will be following through with the online training and actually making the adjustments and setup of all the equipment. This means the instructor will only have to do minor tweaks to the system when they actually meet the student. If you have students turning up on the first day with brand new equipment that has not been configured whatsoever, this can actually take several hours to configure. I have found from years of teaching that this really detracts from what people should be learning on day one, which is all about getting in the water as quickly as possible. They came for an in-water course, so I suggest you get straight to the water and make day one as enjoyable as possible and not have them standing around trying to listen to you. The online training takes care of all this. So with equipment configured or adjusted, the next step is to do a dry land workshop. And this is done in two parts. The first today and the second part will be more involved on day two. Throughout this video, I'll be introducing skills and telling instructors what it is they can do to improve students and what to look out for. Both the student and instructor must have watched the full training video for each skill found in my online training series. So before you get to the water, you want to have every student take the time to practice on the bench, holding the correct body position they'll use underwater. They need to show you the frog kick and also the helicopter turn. Do not keep somebody on the bench too long 
and make sure you GoPro small clips on what it is they're doing for each of the kicks because you can directly compare what they did on land with what they did underwater. Students will, of course, feel what it's like underwater, but they really need to connect this with your GoPro footage so they can really see what it is that actually happened. And this will greatly increase the time it takes each student to learn. Once at the dive site, it is the instructor's responsibility to make sure all cylinders, regulators, harnesses are all configured correctly and each diver enters the water with just what they need, no extra pieces of equipment they will not use. This will give them the best chance of success. You start the session by showing how to don your left and right cylinder showing all the critical steps and what they must do. However, do not have any student actually do this on their own. You should actually do it in sequence for them. So one at a time, they actually assist you, but you're putting the cylinders on them in the correct order and correct sequence. If divers are already coming to us, Cybound certified. At this point, you can act more like a coach and watch them show you what they know. You just critique the missing parts. So they do the donning, and we are more hands off with this exercise than we would be with a brand new Cybound diver. Next, while at the surface, before you go underwater, you're going to go through BCD use, both horizontal and vertical, as well as oral inflation at the surface. You need to make sure all students can access the rear dump valve using either hand, and their BCD low pressure inflator is not cluttered in any way. Also at the surface, you'll need to review pressure gauge checking and regulator switching. These three exercises are of course the most commonly used underwater, so it's important you master them before descending on day one. Next, I want you to conduct a surface weight check for each of the students. It is important to finish donning all the cylinders, then do this one at a time. You want to make sure each student is comfortable, breathing correctly, understanding they must deflate the BCD and not kick their legs as they adjust their lung volume hold to slowly sink from the surface. You must take the time to ensure each student starts with the correct amount of weight. Most of them will have been used to diving too heavy. It's important that the instructor does not talk too much in the water. Each student, I'm sure, has watched several times each of the online training videos which cover each skill you're going to be doing with them. They will understand the common problems and what it is they need to do. The instructor just needs to focus on the fine details, showing the student what it is they do wrong when they see it, how they can fix it. And remember, each student may do something different. So just repeating a full demonstration as an instructor is not the best way to go about it. They don't need to see how good you are, what they need from you is for you to show which bit they are missing, how to fix it, and of course, remind them what it is they're doing well. It's all about the first time somebody gets in the water, everything going well. So do not spend time having the student struggle with donning and doffing their cylinders on day one. Let's instead make it about how good they look 
and feel. This, I'm sure, will be the first time they've ever felt this streamlined and balanced and comfortable underwater. And it's a great start to your course going well for the next few days. With surface weight checks done, make your initial descent. Make sure you've got a gradual sloping bottom. That goes to a depth of around 8 meters or 25 feet. Make sure you record each student and go over their equipment. I call this the 360 review. Anything that doesn't look right, like a loop bungee being too long, the waistband not being correctly tightened, the sliding D ring being in the wrong location, you as the instructor fix it. Do not have the student experience any stress. Just give them the hold signal while you make the adjustments. This ensures that after the first few minutes, the rest of that dive will go extremely well. Remember, the students will always copy anything they see you doing. Day one will be a real eye opener for every student. Most people will bring their favorite fin. This could work well, but it could also be too heavy or light for the diver. You can see here that Vass is carrying a second set of fins, which is different to what some of the students will have. This can easily be switched with each student so they can feel the difference in a trim check or the finning techniques, and they can see video feedback on day one comparing everything they just experienced. As you can see, these three fins all perform differently one negative, one neutral, and the other positive. It's not just the weight of a fin which is important, also, the style, the stiffness will definitely give different results. So, it's important that each student on day one gets the chance to experience different options. But before you start removing or altering anybody's fins, make sure you do a head to toe trim check. This is important to do next, and it will highlight anything which is not quite right with the diver. So it gives you the chance to fix that before you have them perform lots of finning techniques. Everything we do is to set the diver up for success. We're especially not looking to create any more unnecessary problems. This diver is doing the trim check correctly. They're not kicking and sculling, and you can see they're balanced from head to toe. You can see here I'm positioned behind the line marker on the opposite side of the control line, and I'm moving from one student to the next, capturing on video the results from each diver's trim check, which you can see here the legs are clearly dropping too quickly. So that diver has to make a lot of effort to hold the legs up when they're in a static position. So this is a good time to swap out that fin for something that is lighter. Make sure you change the fins for them. Don't have the diver struggling to do this. A diver should breathe in and out as shallow as possible. They do not want to breathe out fully like this because that forces the fins to go up and the body to sink. As you ask each diver to do the trim check, just pay attention to their breathing and make sure that that is not affecting the results. Also, make sure the diver is not kicking or sculling. You can also adjust the diver's weight underwater by moving it up or down the body. I generally avoid making this change on day one and place somebody's weights in the center and I find the fin change makes the most difference. 
cylinders will also play a big part. Here we have two steel cylinders, both at the same pressure. One you can clearly see floats up towards the base and the other lying on the ground. So it's very important that you, as the instructor, know how everything can impact a student so you can best make changes for them. Next, I want you to spend plenty of time making sure each student knows how to use their BCD, both in a horizontal and vertical position. Encourage each student to actually put air in to the BCD via the low pressure inflator on the chest. They'll need to put more air in and of course then let that out. They can change their position to see if the dump still works or not. They'll learn then just how much they need to lower the head or raise the bum to dump air effectively. Give each student plenty of time to practice this again, both horizontal and vertical positions. It's a good idea, as you can see here, with a flexible tape measure we have, we're able to check if the low pressure inflator hose is the correct length for somebody's dry suit or BCD inflator. Of course, you can pick this up anyway when you do a 360 video of somebody's complete equipment. You can see here the BCD inflator hose is sized perfectly. The cylinder valve is sitting flat and close under the armpit. Cylinder bungee has the correct tension. The cylinder is rotating up and round as I let go and pulling into the diver's body, which is perfect. I'm just checking the crotch strap. BCD is all snug around the body. Now we move across to the other side. Again, pushing the cylinder base out, you can see it springs back in and the bungee tension is correct on the valve. Next comes the swim tests. I suggest you set up a horizontal control line that is around 20 meters or 65 feet in length. You're going to have each of the divers perform frog kicks and flutter kicks start all divers going around the line in a circuit the same way around give enough space between each diver so that you can actually take video of all students you want to have divers go at a slow controlled pace and really focus on their fin movement remember just before this dive you would have had each student doing the dry land workshop so they know what it is you're looking for. Remember, in these videos, I'm not going to go into the exact details on how you do every kick. We've covered that in the online videos already. I instead will be giving teaching tips for instructors. For example, your control line should not be too close to the ground. This forces the divers to look down. You're much better having a control line where the diver can swim at eye level with the line. This is the correct height. It's all about setting up your students for success. And this is a great way of doing it. You need enough height above and below the line so divers can use their breathing control fully and see what effect that has, as well as hold the correct body positions. We need to make sure the control line is long enough so divers can continue to swim around. We can capture all the video we need and supervise the divers properly. When a diver is completely balanced from head to toe, it allows you to easily diagnose a finning technique problem like with this frog kick the diver not turning the ankles and fin blades correctly once they see the video we can easily fix this as we move forward after the frog and flutter kick it's now time to start some helicopter turns and we'll do the line touch so you start the diver 
touching the line, starting a helicopter turn in one direction. They attempt to turn all the way around 360 and touch the line again. If they have to swim back towards the line, then they learn how efficient or inefficient their helicopter turn was. The real test here is not just about how well they can move the fins, it really tests their buoyancy and breathing control. This is as much as I would do with divers on day one. Do not be tempted to do other advanced finning techniques like the back kick. Next, you want to take more time to revisit pressure gauge checking and regulator switching. This time, you're going to do it stationary using the control line. You want to have divers practice both two handed and then, of course, one handed as well. I found it quite good to pass them the GoPro, like you can see me holding it here. For some students, it's good to have the hand occupied, it stops it moving. But also, I found for some divers, it actually keeps them more still when they're focusing on keeping something else still. You need a control line. It needs to have a reference marker, which you can see here. And you need to give each student enough time to practice the skills properly. Many of them will have to be repeated. And it might be that during a repetition, the mistake is made. Knowing how much to record and review is tricky. With experience, you'll learn how much to do. I generally get divers to hold and then I get them to do a skill when I'm ready with the camera. Then I'll cut it each time. But I'll also let it run long enough to see whatever problems are happening. Having the control line between you and the student allows you both to see things quickly and efficiently so that no time is actually wasted. And a diver can quickly see if doing that skill has impacted their buoyancy. Of course, we're training every diver for the real scenario, diving with a teammate, and that diver then being able to easily adjust, check, communicate, makes the whole dive run much more smoothly, safer, and of course, more enjoyable. Leading on from checking your pressure, of course, is switching your regulator. In side mount, we're going to be breathing from one cylinder, then the other. So divers will need to do this. Now, I like to get divers moving underwater, hence the finning techniques being shown earlier. But maybe halfway through the finning techniques, you should introduce pressure gauge checks and regulator switches. This way, keeping the diver's cylinders balanced. And of course, if they had a problem, they know how to switch that regulator out. It's a good idea to break static skills with moving skills whenever possible. So you're really trying to keep the divers as still as possible, get clear communication from them, and help them learn as quickly and efficiently as possible. Most of the time, Instead of doing full demonstrations, what you'll need to do is just reinforce and remind students of all the little things that make the difference, like how to correctly hold their breakaway bolt snap on their long hose. They will have seen the online training videos, so they're coming to you for all the small things and so you can help fast track what it is that diver is capable of learning. Once divers have mastered the regulator switch with pressure gauge checks, of course, you can have them doing it one handed. All side mount divers should learn to do most things one handed where possible. Because if you want to use a dive light or a video camera, you know, it's going to occupy your hand. Yes, you can change which hand you're holding something, but you definitely need to be comfortable using one hand to make the switch. 
if our complete video on regulator switching does not cover something you want more information on, then just drop a comment on this video and get in touch. Next, it makes sense if you've switched a regulator, you're going to need to trim that side mount cylinder a little, especially if you're using aluminum cylinders. Once you show your divers how to check and trim their cylinders, then the great thing to see is as you progress through each of the skills and days, if they're still able to remember to keep their cylinders in trim pretty much all the time, this tells you a lot about that diver's awareness level. Since you've now got divers thinking about and adjusting the trim of their cylinder, then to create even more awareness, the next exercise I do is a single cylinder removal. I have the diver remove the right side mount cylinder, leaving the left primary cylinder with the BCD inflator in place. They're not to move too far away from their cylinder, and of course, they stay close to you. And before they remove their cylinder, you have both your cylinders in place so you can hand off your long hose to anybody who may experience a problem with their regulator, which is highly unlikely. I've found that doing this exercise really improves the diver's ability to hold body position. It of course shows them the impact one cylinder has on their trim and at the side of their body and gives them a little taste of cylinder handling because they need to actually remove and replace that cylinder, which they'll be doing much more of in the next coming days. Lastly, is one of the most important exercises and something that has to be completed on day one. This is the end of dive weight check. It confirms how well our surface weight check was done. Each cylinder gets drained to its reserve capacity, which is 50 bar or 750 psi. Do a test at that pressure, and if you want to take it to the extreme, then reduce it as far as 30 bar or 500 psi in each cylinder and do the checks again. Make sure there's enough time and each diver has enough air to do the full end of dive weight check. This way they leave day one being correctly weighted. You may need to adjust the weight somebody has, a little more or a little less. They'll need enough time to make the full end of dive weight check again. A good instructor using our surface weight check will get somebody within plus or minus one kilo or 2.2 pounds of their end weight. As an instructor, everything you do needs to be right. Your cylinders in trim, your finning techniques, your position, and most importantly, you're there for them. You're not there to show off. What you should do is be priding yourself on how fast and efficiently your students can learn something from you. With weight checks done, everybody makes their way back to the exit. Now, it's really important that you de-kit each of the students. Again, you do the work, they assist you. You want this day to continue going well. You don't want them to have any frustration de-kitting their equipment. Once they've got their equipment off, you can do a full demonstration of how you remove your equipment, and that gives them a heads up for the next days that are coming. But it's important, they will be tired, they will have done a lot already. So, like I'm showing here, just the important things about how you might hold the cylinder and pass it to somebody on the land or on a boat can be useful to share. But to be honest, they probably just want to get out the water. 
And this is something you should make as easy as possible, not have them do what this diver is doing on day three of his course, which is making a solo exit with two cylinders. I'm sure all the divers will be very excited to see themselves on video from what you shot underwater. During the course, it's a good idea to keep your feedback and videos shown to exactly what each diver needs to see and benefit from. And how much time you have available each evening will determine that as well. What you've got to be careful of is that you don't exhaust the student. You've got to give them enough time to rest, recuperate, and absorb what it is they're learning each day. The days will be long, but I guarantee it will be the best training they've ever received. Now, let's go and look at day two 